Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Now that we have come to a point where we will talk about that how Arabs used to perceive the two areas that I've talked about, Sindh and Hind. To Arabs, these were two different regions. Anything to the west of the Indus Valley River and not all the way to the north, but from the seashore all the way to the city of Multan and coming to the west, probably around Makran, parts of, uh, uh, you can say, uh, the Khaybar uh, Pakhtunkhwa, which is one of the provinces in Pakistan, some of the areas a little bit going into the Afghanistan, that kind of a region give and take over the period of time because the borders have been constantly shifting would be regarded as sin. But for the most part, if you are looking at from the modern day, from Karachi all the way to Multan, if you are going from um, by the seashore all the way to in, inland, uh, going north, and then if you are traveling west, then by Makran area. So that was that what Arabs would regard as uh, sin. And anything on the other side of the Indus Valley, they would call it Hind. And the word Sindh actually comes from a Persian word, which comes from a Sanskrit word. It simply means river. So it over the period of time, it translated from a Sanskrit word for river to a Persian word Sindh, and then into Greek it became Indos. So when Greeks came. Now, Greeks also ruled this area for some time. And then the leadership went into the hands of the local kings and then became an Indo-Greek colony. Uh, and then it went back to the locals. Uh, so things have been shifting back and forth. Every 100, 200 years, uh, the leadership would change and will go in different hands. Uh, so this is... A map where you can see how it looked like somewhat at the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or around that time. But this is regarded as the area of Sindh and on the other side will be the Hind. Now from Sindh as well as Hind, there were constant trade routes uh, that were established mainly via the sea routes. And the commodities were coming from the ports of Sindh and Hind to the ports of modern-day Iraq, um, Iran, and the modern-day Yemen. And I will tell you exactly what are the regions, because modern-day Iraq was not in Iraq back then. Uh, that was part of the Persian Empire. And maybe parts of Iraq in these times uh, were shared between the, um, the borders would be shifting between the Romans and the Persian empires. So that's one more thing you have to keep in mind as to how this was happening. So we'll briefly talk about the trades. We'll briefly talk about uh, the points uh, where uh, this kind of a trade was happening. And we will also briefly touch base on the movement of the Indians into the Arabia and into the Persian Empire and down south in the Yemen and how they used to live. And then as we are unfolding this, we will talk more about it as to who these people were. So what these people did who are coming from Sindh or they're coming from Hind, they are bringing their goods on land or via the sea routes. And when they're bringing their goods via sea routes, they are taking them by the coastal line of the Arabian Gulf. And then they are delivering them where we have modern day Basra. Basra was not in existence back then. It was rather Ubla at that point where Basra, Basra is. So the city of Basra, by that, by, very close to Basra, there was a port where they will bring the goods. And the other thing to keep in mind is that between the Basra and going all the way to India and beyond, there were islands. There were, those islands were sometimes a day's journey or two days journey or three days journey. And, and those were some of the other stopping points for all of these uh, ships that they are sailing. And most of these ships will sail very close to the coastal line. So they're leaving Dibal, which is now Karachi, 
or Mumbai, which is which which was previously called Bombay, but that wasn't its original name back in. Uh, if you look at the old books, uh, it had other names over the period of time, and or coming from Sri Lanka or coming from South India, they were traveling mostly by the coastals and then going through the coastal lines, was traveling very close to the seashore and not going into the deep waters and then entering into the Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf and then uh, or uh, heading straight, avoiding Persian Gulf and heading straight by the coastal line of Oman and hitting the ports uh, or traveling past Oman by the coastal line and hitting um, Aden or Eden in Yemen. This is basically the travel route. And then from the Yemen, this good could be distributed via coastal line to Ethiopia or the Horn of Africa, where you have Ethiopia, Somalia, and some of the Djibouti and some of the other countries. Or it could leave the port of uh, Aden and it would go in the Red Sea. And then you have several ports along the side. You have the port of Jeddah. Back in those days, there was another port. Jeddah was not the port, but very close to Jeddah, there used to be a port. And then going up uh, to the western side of Medina, there were ports. And going up into the Palestine port, and then that would allow them to take goods all the way to the farthest tip in Red Sea. And there were several ports along the side, and some were controlled by Romans. Uh, and then some on the other side were controlled by uh, Egyptian government, like in Alexandria. And then from there, they could transport goods um, on the other side into the Mediterranean Sea and then travel to the Europe. So there are lots and lots of trade routes if you are looking at it from that perspective. So these are all sea routes. And then um, if you are looking at the land, and you will see there were land routes going from Byzantine Syrian province uh, going across the Persian Empire into through the Silk Road into China or coming down uh, into other parts of Persia. And Persian Empire was far stretched at points where it would stretch from um, areas of Syria past Iraq, covering entire Iran, maybe some of the upper areas like Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, those kind of areas, or, or Khuzestan, or Khurasan, and then going into the Afghanistan and the northern areas of Pakistan and the southern areas of Pakistan by Balochistan. And a lot of these kingdoms uh, in the area of Sindh, which I explained to you, uh, they were independent kingdoms, but they were extremely reliant and they were very much in favor of the Persian Empire. It's pretty much like uh, the British have left the Arabian Peninsula, but you see a lot of those kings, they have uh, very different treatment when it comes to um, requests from their old um, colonized lords. <laughs> So it was similar kind of a deal where Persia had a lot of influence on these on the Sindh, sometimes by directly ruling it and sometimes by indirectly keeping the local kings as puppets and they would send in resources, they would send in enforcements. Uh, a lot of these armies from the for who would, uh, the people who would fight in the Persian army, sometimes they would be recruited from Makran, from different parts of Balochistan, from Sindh, and these people would go into Persian army and would settle in different places. Also, there were uh, people from India, they migrated, or people from Sindh or Hind, they migrated to different parts of Arabia, especially uh, not limited to Yemen and not limited to Lakhmites, where the Basra and the surrounding environment is. There were a lot of uh, smaller tribal settlements there, but a lot of the, in, uh, the people from Hind and Sindh who moved to Arabia, they would either live in the settlements and they would make their smaller neighborhoods within the settlement because that would make a lot of things accessible to them and they would be able to run their small business very efficiently. Very few of them would actually roam around like the nomads and would settle where um, you would find a source of water. But uh, remember, even in Arabia, the Arabian tribes were of two kinds. One who would live in settlements and they had 
uh, all th forms and shapes of life to sustain. They, they had gardens and they have orchards and they have goats or sheep and they had camels and, and you know, maybe um, other means of sustenance. And those who were just in the wilderness moving around, they just had camels and they would just go from one place to another looking for a water source and the grass and they would just keep moving around like that. So there were some Indian tribes of that nature too. So uh, the idea is to help you understand the Sindh and the Hind not being just different areas for the people of Arabia alone, but also that distinction was made at some point in time by the Persians or the Greeks. And then also when these people came to Arabia, some of them were just coming and going like uh, business people coming on a business trip and some of them actually settled here and were they and they were running their business from here they were using their contacts back home and they were utilizing them to bring in goods and sell them in the local markets just like you would do now with the import export business that somebody from Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or other parts of the world uh, they would establish their business in the western lands and would just bring, import goods from their homeland and would sell in the local market. So uh, different forms of trades were happening at that time and a lot of, most majority of the people who migrated from Hind and Sindh area into Persian Empire or in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, they integrated into the locals. They integrated into the locals. And especially, uh, they settled along the coastal lines, mostly in the Lakhmite areas, because that's where the Arab tribal mentality and the, and, and the paganism align very well with the Hindu paganism. So uh, they were both idol worshippers. So they aligned pretty well in there. Plus, uh, they didn't have to directly live under the Persian rule, but they are living under a tribal rule, which is under the Persian rule, very similar to those kings under whom they were serving before, who were independent kings, but were under the Persian influence. So they uh, lived pretty well. Plus, they, li they lived very close to the ports, which helped them do the business and sustenance. So I hope with the help of these maps and these graphs and the arrows, you're able to somewhat understand um, the relationship of Hind and Sindh uh, with the Arabian Peninsula, with the Persians, and how things were moving uh, in this whole region connecting Africa with Europe, with Asia, and stretching Asia to as far as you could stretch through the coastal lines or through the land. So our next, our next lecture, I want to talk about also what kind of commodities were actually coming from Hind and Sindh to the Arabian world that they were interested in buying and then also who were those people uh, that were mostly uh, moving into these lands either uh, completely settling over here and were e the people of Medina and Makkah also aware of these Indians. Um, we'll talk about all of those things but in the coming videos one step at a time. Um, Till next time, assalamu alaikum.